welcome all of you uh, here today. This is uh, the, an annual program for those of you who are second and third years uh, or people who have come here from outside the law school. Uh, this is a program that we do every year and it's sort of our way to celebrate the beginning of a new school year. And one of the ways we celebrate the beginning of a new school year is to look ahead to what we think might be happening in the current year and look back at what happened in the previous year. And it's also a way for us to celebrate both our professors as well as our programs, as well as a guest today who I will mention uh, for a moment. Now, this is also one way for us, we have a number of great programs at the law school. Some of them new, some of them have existed for several years. And one of the things that I'm most proud about at the law school is our programs typically work together for events like tonight. And this is a pro, this a, a event tonight, whether the court is being co-sponsored by the Business Law and Policy Program, the Critical Race Studies Program, the Evan Frankel Environmental Law and Policy Program, the Program in Public Interest Law and Policy, and the Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation Law and Public Policy. And you know, that is a tremendous group of different entities, think tanks, some of which might agree with each other on some point, some, some would disagree on other points, but coming together to show the importance that we hold our Supreme Court and that we hold uh, the law and our ability to be uh, thinking and talking about what are important trends for the future. So without wanting to listen to me anymore, I just want to also thank uh, our faculty who are uh, going to join us tonight. And th those include Ann Carlson, Gary Rowe, Russell Robinson, John Verrett, and Kim Urocco, who's visiting with us from Northwestern this year. And of course, Brad Sears, who annually moderates and does a wonderful job in arranging tonight. And I'd also like to thank someone who isn't moderating, who isn't sitting on the panel, but who is running around uh, making sure that everything goes well and who naturally isn't here whenever I thank her. And, and uh, that is Kathy Mayorkas, who is, who is really wonderful. And, and of course, Rochelle Edelman, who is also uh, someone who is so important to us putting together events like this. So without uh, any more comment from me, I'd like to get rid of this microphone and turn it over to Brad. Oh, wait, 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 I forgot to introduce the, our guest. Brad, you can't get up yet. So also, I want to introduce David Savage. Now, many of you uh, who, you know, he's always very modest in saying very few people are reading newspapers anymore. I read, whenever David has an article, I read his, his work and, you know, it's, it's typically very penetrating, very interesting. We had a very interesting talk with the faculty today, which David was our guest, giving us some, some taste for what it's like to be an insider in Washington about the Supreme Court. And we're just very, very lucky to welcome him to perhaps not his hometown, but his home paper town. So welcome, David. Now, Brad. So recently, there was another one of those surveys that are designed to show just how little Americans know almost about everything. Um, and we didn't do so well. According to this survey, while three quarters of Americans can name two of the seven dwarves, um, only about a quarter can name two of the members of the Supreme Court. But as one commenter pointed out, this really isn't fair because the seven dwarves never change, unlike members of the Supreme Court. Well, we haven't had a change for the Supreme Court for a while, and we had two this past term. So tonight, um, we have a great panel of experts who are going to discuss what a difference those two might have made or might make in the future on the Supreme Court. Um, our first speaker tonight is Professor Russell Robinson, who clerked for Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court and now teaches here at UCLA Law, Anti-Discrimination Law, Law and Psychology, and Media and Entertainment Law. Uh, Professor Robinson is going to discuss a case that um, is close to the home for anyone who's involved with the law school, Rumsfeld versus Fair. Thank you, Brad, uh, and to all the organizations that are hosting this tonight. I'm talking about Rumsfeld versus Fair, 
which is an intriguing and complex case because it involves liberal law professors who support gay rights, relying heavily on an anti-gay precedent, or at least a precedent that many perceive to be anti-gay, Boy Scouts of America versus Dale. Um, a five-justice majority in Dale held that the Boy Scouts had the First Amendment right to eject James Dale, a gay man, uh, after he came out of the closet and he wanted to continue being a leader of the Boy Scouts. The forced inclusion of Dale and the Scouts, the court said, would significantly burden the organization's right to oppose homosexual conduct. The Fair case posed the question whether the court would extend Dale um, and apply it to other contexts, but specifically apply it to, in this case, to advance gay rights, at least in the short term. And I'll get to, near the end of my talk, about um, how the long-term effects of expanding the case law in this way and fair could actually have some very detrimental impacts for minorities. The dispute was between military recruiters and law schools that wanted to exclude the military because of its don't ask, don't tell policy. I assume that you all are familiar with this policy, which restricts the ability of homosexuals to serve in the military. The lawsuit was brought by the Forum for Academic and Institutional Rights, or FAIR, as they called themselves, an association of law schools and law faculties. And these schools objected to the Solomon Amendment, um, a law passed by Congress that forces institutions to choose between enforcing their anti-discrimination policies that apply to all employers uh, and um, continuing to receive specified federal funding. Now, they would not have lost all federal funding. For instance, as you probably are eager to know, student loan funding would have been preserved. Uh, but a lot of other very important federal funding would have been lost if these schools uh, refused to allow military recruiters to have access to their campuses. Um, the law was amended, importantly, several times um, as this contest between Congress and the law schools escalated, uh, and especially after September 11th. Um, and again, the, the law requires access uh, to military recruiters, um, and it also requires that they be treated equally, to, or be treated according to the same terms that other employers are treated. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, and it's interesting that this was a unanimous opinion. There were eight justices. Justice Alito did not participate. Uh, at the outset, Roberts noted that Congress deserved some degree of deference because it was legislating pursuant to its Article I power to provide for the military. Although Congress's power in this area is broad and sweeping, the court said, uh, it nonetheless is subject to First Amendment constraints. Now, the Third Circuit, which had heard this case in the court below, had found three ways that the Solomon Amendment violated the First Amendment. First, it said the law requires law schools to assist military recruiters by sending emails and distributing flyers to facilitate interviews. And these emails and flyers, the court said, are compelled speech. Second, the th Third Circuit held that by forcing law schools to permit the military on campus to express its message, the Solomon Amendment unconstitutionally requires law schools to host the military speech. And third, the court said that even if the Solomon Amendment regulates conduct rather than speech, it infringes law schools' right to engage in expressive conduct. The First Amendment protects speech, but also expressive conduct like burning an American flag. The Supreme Court rejected each of these arguments, providing three main reasons why the Solomon Amendment did not violate FAIR's First Amendment rights. First, the court said that the amendment regulates conduct, the, the Solomon Amendment regulates conduct, granting access to military recruiters, not speech. The court had held in prior cases that laws that target conduct and incidentally burden speech are less objectionable than laws that directly target speech. The court in this case said the Solomon Amendment primarily regulated conduct, and the speech-related requirements, the emails, uh, were incidental and minor. Now, I think that this part of the holding is sound and consistent with many of the court's precedents. A second, the court rejected Fair's analogy between the present dispute and prior cases in which the government forced a speaker to host or accommodate another speaker's message. Now, the key cases here, and I won't go into the facts because they're pretty complicated, but you may be familiar with Hurley versus Irish American Gay Lesbian and Bisexual Group of Boston, which was a parade case, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, Miami Herald versus Tornillo. So these were the cases that were cited by Fair, but the court rejected the analogy and said that they weren't on point because the compelled speech violation resulted in those cases from the fact that the complaining speaker's own message was affected by the speech it was forced to host or accommodate. The court distinguished the precedent by holding that the law schools are not speaking when they host recruiting functions. They said, this is just conduct, it's not speech. Because the school is not communicating any message by conducting recruiting, there is necessarily no interference with the message. 
The court's main support for this claim was a cite to the Pruneyard case, which arose from California. In that case, the court upheld California's requirement that a shopping center owner allow certain expressive activities by others on its property because there was little likelihood that the views of those engaging in the expressive activities would be identified or attributed to the owner. Now, I think the court's reasoning on this second point is questionable. The law school said that they were sending a message about their opposition to discrimination. The court rejected this claim without providing any method or guidance for determining what constitutes speech or, or expression. Moreover, although there is some intuitive appeal to the conclusion that law students would understand that the military recruiter's access was compelled, or at least coerced by law, and thus should not be attributed to the law schools, the same argument could have been made in the Dale case. In that case, James Dale argued that he was not speaking and attempting to maintain his membership in the Boy Scouts. He simply wanted access to the Scouts, and he had no intent to communicate any message co contrary to the Scouts' message or proclaim any message about gay identity. The Scouts, conversely, argued that forcing the organization to include Dale as a member would compel it to send a message that it supports homosexuality. The Dale court could have easily concluded that because the state law required the Scouts to include Dale, Dale's identity would not be attributed to the Scouts. And I think this is consistent with the understanding that an organization like UCLA can enroll gay students or hire gay professors without making some statement about gay identity. But the court did not accept that argument there. Uh, the court said that the public would take away the message that the Boy Scouts support gay identity. Similarly, the court emphasized that the law schools and FAIR were free to express their condemnation of the military. But in Dale also, the Scouts could have publicly condemned homosexuality and Dale's gay identity, even as the law required it to include Dale as a member. Now, the court disposed of FAIR's speech claim with the first two arguments that I've just detailed, but the expressive association claim remained. This claim also failed, the court said, in its third main point, because law school recruiting is not inherently expressive. Further, the court stated that permitting recruiters to access campus is not comparable to requiring them to be members of a community, as was the case in Dale. Now, aspects of this rationale, I think, are also troubling. Even if, in general, law school recruiting is not particularly expressive, in the heated context of the war in Iraq, struggling military recruitment, law school opposition to the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, and congressional efforts to crush this opposition, a law school's decision to reject the military recruiters was quite politicized and expressive in this context. I would say, why should it matter if recruiting is not inherently expressive, if it is expressive in this particular context, and the, because that's the context that's before the court? Also, it's important to note that the court in this case stumbled upon what I would call a black hole in First Amendment doctrine. A person can engage in a limitless array of conduct in order to express a point, say, refusing to pay taxes because the tax code discriminates against the poor, or writing graffiti on public buildings to protest the war. Yet few would argue that the First Amendment gives such people the right not to pay taxes or to ignore property laws. In essence, the court has never come up with a good way of defining expressive conduct, which is subject to special scrutiny, and separating it from general conduct, which can be freely regulated. The fair opinion can be read in as an attempt to patch up this black hole, but in a rather cursory and incomplete fashion. The court quoted Dale's statement that a mere assertion of an expressive burden would not suffice. But in the same portion of the opinion that the fair court cited, Dale had said, quote, we must give deference to an association's view of what would impair its expression. The fair court ignored this language and gave no deference to the law school's claim. It flatly rejected the association claim. Fair thus seems to curb a troubling suggestion of Dale that organizations could use the First Amendment to justify discrimination, and the courts would have to defer to the organization's assertions as to the burden it would face from associating with outsiders. Now, in the worst-case scenario, Dale's deference rule could be extended to employers, arming them with a First Amendment right to uh, refuse to hire women and people of color because it didn't want to send any message about gender equality or racial equality. The fair opinion fortunately indicates that the court is not likely to go down this road. It is limiting Dale, not expanding it. The upshot is that even those who champion gay rights and the right of the university to punish discrimination can breathe a little bit easier after fair. Thank you.
Next, we have a visitor to UCI Law from Northwestern Law, Professor Kimberly Urocco, who teaches employment law, property, and family law. She's going to continue discussing some significant cases that came up this past term with the First Amendment by discussing Garcetti versus Ceballos. Six, in a five to four decision written by Justice Kennedy, the Supreme Court delivered its ruling in the case of Garcetti versus Sabias. The case raised the issue of whether the First Amendment protects a government employee from discipline based on speech made pursuant to the employee's official duties. Now, in answering the question, the court carved out more clearly and explicitly than it had done before a category of public employee speech that was excluded entirely from First Amendment protection. In the process, the court also revealed its own philosophical divide about the purpose and value of the First Amendment in the context of public employment. So I'm going to begin by describing the facts and holding of the case, and then I'll briefly discuss the philosophical schism that the case reveals. So Richard Sabias was employed as a deputy district attorney for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. In February of 2000, Sabias was contacted by a defense attorney who told him that there were inaccuracies in an affidavit used to obtain a search warrant in a particular case. Now, the defense attorney had filed a motion to challenge the affidavit, challenge the warrant, but he asked Sabias to review the case as well. After examining the affidavit, Sabias decided that it did contain some serious misrepresentations. Sabias told his supervisors about the perceived inaccuracies in the warrant, and as part of his official job duties, he prepared a memo explaining his concerns and recommending dismissal of the case. Sabias' supervisors decided to proceed with the prosecution despite his misgivings. The trial court then held a hearing on the motion challenging the search warrant. Sabias was called by the defense and testified about the alleged inaccuracies. The trial court rejected the challenge to the warrant and proceeded with the case. After the trial, after the hearing rather, Sabias claims he was retaliated against by being reassigned to a position with different job duties, transferred to a different courthouse, and denied a promotion. After his internal grievance was denied, Sabias filed the present action against Los Angeles County alleging that the district attorney's office violated his First Amendment rights by retaliating against him because of his challenging to the validity, his challenge to the validity of the search warrant. Now, the district court granted the county's motion for summary judgment on the grounds that Sabias' speech was not constitutionally protected. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed, and the case was then taken up by the, the Supreme Court. Now, in a series of cases, beginning with Pickering versus Board of Education, decided in 1968, the Supreme Court developed a two-pronged test for evaluating public employee speech claims. So first, the court would ask whether the employee spoke as a citizen on a matter of public concern. If he did not, the employee's speech was entitled to no First Amendment protection. If he did, the court would then move on to the second prong and ask whether the speech interests of the employee outweighed the interests of the government as employer in maintaining the efficient and effective operation of its public services. If the employee's speech interests won out, the speech was entitled to First Amendment protection. If they did not, the speech was unprotected. Now, courts have focused considerable attention on what it means for speech to be on a matter of public concern and on how to appropriately balance the interests of the employer and the employee. Generally overlooked in this analysis has been the requirement, as part of the first public concern prong, that an employee must have been speaking in her or his role as a citizen. It was on this requirement, however, that the Supreme Court focused in Sabias. Now, first, the court differentiated between speech made in an employee's official capacity, employee's capacity as a citizen, and speech made as part of her official job duties, the latter, according to the court, being necessarily distinct from the former. So when a public employee speaks pursuant to employment responsibilities, the court explained, there is no relevant analog to speech by citizens who are not governmental employees. The court then held that when public employees make statements pursuant to their official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for First Amendment purposes, and the Constitution does not insulate their communications from employer discipline. In explaining its holding, the court emphasized the need for public employers to be able to control speech made by employees in their professional capacity. 
In order for government employers to operate effectively, the court argued, supervisors needed the power to ensure that employers' official employees' official communications were accurate and promoted the employer's mission. Such a limitation on First Amendment protection does not prevent public employees from participating in the public debate, the court explained. It simply reinforces the fact that the First Amendment does not invest them with a right to perform their jobs however they see fit. Moreover, the court pointed out, public employees speaking out about misconduct in the government itself would remain protected by various whistleblower statutes, even if not protected by the First Amendment itself. Now, because Tobias' memorandum criticizing the search warrant was made pursuant to his duties as a calendar deputy, the court concluded that it was not entitled to First Amendment protection. Now, the majority opinion in this case sparked three lively dissents. The dissenting justices did not disagree with the majority about the importance of ensuring that government employers have the power to control and discipline their employees. They did, however, disagree with the categorical nature of the majority's rule. So the dissenting justices did not agree that speech rendered pursuant to one's official duties should be wholly devoid of constitutional protection without regard to either the importance of the speech or its effect on the workplace. As a theoretical matter, the dissenters argued, the majority's distinction between speech made in one's capacity as a citizen and speech made in one's capacity as a public servant was far more blurry than the majority acknowledged. As a practical matter, the dissenters argued, the majority's rule would lead to several harmful consequences. The public would be deprived of valuable information about government services by those people most knowledgeable about their operations. Employers would be encouraged to define job responsibilities overly broadly so as to exclude as much speech as possible from First Amendment protection. And potentially, at least, academic freedom would be imperiled if the teaching and scholarship of professors at public universities was considered to be part of their official duties and hence excluded from First Amendment protection. Finally, the dissenters argued, the patchwork of state and federal whistleblower statutes were inadequate to protect even those public employees speaking out about governmental misconduct. Now, this case is important not only because of its holding, but also because of the divergent views it reveals among the justices about the purpose and value of the First Amendment in the context of public employment. So for the majority, the purpose of extending First Amendment protection to public employees was limited to ensuring that the state could not leverage its power as an employer to deny employees liberties they would otherwise enjoy as citizens. A public employer could not, for example, condition an employee's job on her disavowal of certain political views, nor use public employment generally as a reward for political speech. The First Amendment was meant to protect against this narrow and particular kind of abuse by public employers. Now, for the dissent, in contrast, the purpose of the First Amendment was not only or even primarily to prevent a harm to public employees, but to provide a benefit for society at large by encouraging the dissemination of valuable information. Public employees were in the best position to know how government services were operating. Without First Amendment protection, the public would be deprived of this valuable information. As Justice Souter noted in his dissent, the interest at stake in public employee speech cases was as much the public's interest in receiving informed opinion as it was the employee's own right to disseminate it. Now, clearly in Sabayas, the majority's narrower conception of the First Amendment won. The effect of the case is to make First Amendment protection for public employees dependent not only on the substance of their speech, but on the status and job duties of the speaker. So, for example, while Sabayas' speech was unprotected, the logic of the case suggests that had he been a secretary giving voice to the same concerns about police misconduct, his speech would have been protected. Similarly, the case also suggests, for example, that complaints about racially discriminatory hiring at a public school by a personnel director would not be protected, while the same speech by a teacher or janitor at the school would be protected. Now, it remains to be seen how enduring this distinction will be and how much, if any, valuable speech society loses out on as a result. What is clear is that lower courts will now be grappling with a newly critical distinction 
in public employee free speech cases, namely whether the employee is speaking in her capacity as a citizen or as an employee. The next case that's going to be discussed has been described as a train wreck, and not only for former House Majority Leader Tom the Hammer DeLay. Helping us sort out a real mess of opinions, um, we're very fortunate to have a leading constitutional scholar, one of the authors of one of the leading textbooks. He teaches con law here, um, as well as separation of powers and federal courts, and was clerk for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Byron Wright, former dean of UCLA Law, and Professor Jonathan Barrett. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as Brad suggested, I get to describe what was what everybody agrees was the most fractured opinion of the term. Um, you may recall back when Chief Justice Roberts was a nominee, and he was um, he tried to indicate that he would, as much as possible, bring the court together. And to some extent during the term, he was able to do that by focusing on narrow rulings. Uh, but in this case, it just didn't work. Um, and it looks very much like what went before. So this is a case about race and politics and gerrymandering, otherwise known as the political manipulation of congressional district lines in order to favor either one racial group or one um, political party. And because of the difficulty that race and politics often are close together, it's very difficult to disentangle, and that makes a particular problem for the court. So here's what happened. Um, before the 2000 census, I think it's fair to say that for several decades, the Democrats managed very successfully to gerrymander Texas districts. And so they got a lot more seats in Congress than the proportion of their vote uh, statewide. Um, but little by little, by virtue of that political development that we've all been observing for the last 40 years, um, the Republicans began to gain strength in the South, including Texas. As of the 2000 uh, census, there has to be redistricting, as you know, every 10 years by the states. And as of the 2000 census, the um, Republicans had received about 59% of the vote statewide, and the Democrats 40% of the vote. But the Democrats had 17 seats and the Republicans 13 seats. Now, after the 2000 census, because Texas, like a lot of other uh, Sunbelt states, had grown in population, it now has 32 congressional seats. Um, after the 2000 census, there was now a Republican governor, a Republican Senate, but still a Democratic House. And there was no ability of those political forces to produce a new plan. They could not agree. As is not uncommon when there is political conflict like that, it went to, the, to a court. The three-judge court drafted a plan that was um, one that adopted neutral principles, districting principles as much as possible, certainly not based on advantaging one particular race or one particular um, political party. But depending on the story, there are two different stories here. One story is that because they did that, they essentially entrenched the prior Democratic apportionment, and the 2002 elections proved that the Republicans who continued to get 59% of the vote and the Democrats 40% of the vote, the Democrats retained 17 seats, but now the Republicans had 15 seats. Um, after, the, uh, after the elections, however, eventually the, the House, uh, the State House in Texas also became Republican. Now all three branches were Republican. And the Republicans decided to see what they could do to move this the other way around. Now this is a mid-decade redistricting. And you may recall that Democrats sometimes fled to Oklahoma in order to prevent the quorum from being, um, <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, shenanigans, one might say, in all directions. One of which was that the, uh, that the Republicans were still having difficulty imposing their own reapportionment map because there was a rule in the state Senate that it required a two-thirds vote in order to bring the reapportionment map to the floor. And the Democrats had enough votes to prevent that from happening. Uh, 
Um, so the Republicans changed the rule of two-thirds to a majority. Um, that's always interesting. We saw that in the filibuster too, right? Changing a majoritarian rule to, re to get rid of a supermajoritarian rule. They did that and then they imposed after they managed to get one Democrat at least to come back from, a, from outside of Texas. Um, they adopted a map that now with um, Republicans having gotten 58% of the vote in the 2002 election and Democrats 41, um, now it produced a result where Republicans got 21 seats and Democrats got 11 seats. So we went from, a, Texas went from, a um, predominantly entrenched Democratic gerrymander to a predominantly entrenched Republican gerrymander. Now there were attacks on the gerrymander, and, and if I can describe quickly what those were. Um, the attacks on the gerrymander were both statewide and with respect to a couple of districts. So the statewide, statewide gerrymander was essentially the following. If a legislature takes a court-ordered plan, the middle of a decade replaces it with a plan for the sole purpose of increasing its partisan advantage to the, at the expense of the minority political party, that that violates the Equal Protection Clause and also the First Amendment right of political association for penalizing people for now being Democrats. It would have been the other way around before. Uh, secondly, there was a challenge to some of the districts. So Congressman Henry Bonilla was in a district which was um, increasingly Latino and increasingly Latino citizens, and he got no more than about 10% of the vote from that group. Um, the Republicans in the Texas legislature wanted to protect Republican Representative Bonilla, so they moved 100,000 Latino voters out of his district and into another district. And they instead, they added uh, an Anglo-Republican group. Um, that would have created one less Latino opportunity district in Texas. That would then conflict with the Voting Rights Act. So they decided to make a compensating uh, district that would have a majority of Latino voters but this time they would be split between the a Latino community around Austin, Texas, and then like sort of like a dumbbell, right? There was a big district around um, Austin, then a narrow bar, and then down at the bottom there was another large group of Latinos in, around McAllen and other parts of southern Texas. Don't test me on my geography. I don't know Texas that well. Um, so the challenge was to both the Bonilla district for diluting the um, emerging Latino vote in that district, and for the um, creation of the new district, and finally a district that was represented by Martin Frost, a longtime white Democratic legislator, very effective legislator, who was supported. He was in a multiracial district. There was no majority. It was about 20 percent black. It was about 35 percent um, Latino, and it was about 40 percent, I believe, white. And um, the blacks, however, had consistently supported Frost, who was very responsive to their concerns. So that district was, was cracked, as they say in the gerrymandering business. Um, they took the black voters and they split them up into six different districts. And the idea was obviously to get Frost out of uh, Congress. And so there was an attack on that one for the dilution of the voting influence they didn't have majority power, but the voting influence of blacks in that district. So this comes before the court, and the question is what to do with it under the Voting Rights Act, the Equal Protection Clause, and the First Amendment. Um, there's a couple of simple answers here. First of all, when it comes to redistricting, which is a state responsibility, there have been a couple of constitutional limits imposed. One constitutional limit that you're all familiar with is one person, one vote. The districts have to be roughly equal in population. A second that emerged in, in the 1990s was the notion that the use of race as a predominant um, motivation for drawing a district line was presumptively unconstitutional. However, the drawing of district lines for a presumptively partisan purpose, political purpose, has never been declared unconstitutional. In fact, the court has questioned whether it should intervene at all because districting is such a political act in the first place. As of a couple of years ago in a case called Veith against Jubilerer, if I pronounce that correctly, from Pennsylvania, 
Uh, four members of the court have concluded that um, partisan gerrymandering claims are so-called political questions. That is, there's no judicially manageable standards for a court to decide whether they violate the Constitution or not, and therefore they can't rule on them, even if they think they're terrible. Um, five members of the court, however, decided, well, I should break that five down. Four members of the court decided, well, there are some judicially manageable standards, except they couldn't agree on what that standard was. They all had different standards. The fifth member of the court, now at the center of our court, Justice Kennedy, decided that by and large he couldn't find one that was manageable, but there might be one out there somewhere. And he didn't want to preclude the possibility that that could come forward and could be shown that there was such a thing, and therefore the possibility of partisan gerrymandering claims could go forward. Fast forward to the Texas case. The court now concludes that we're still exactly in the same place we were before. Um, actually, of the four who concluded that partisan gerrymandering claims are non-justiciable, that is, the courts won't decide them, two of them were Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor, and they have been replaced by Justice, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito. Um, they actually reached the conclusion in this case, because the justiciability question wasn't open again, that whether it was on the merits or because it was non-justiciable, the plaintiffs had not shown in this case that there was a reliable standard by which they could measure a deviation um, from a constitutional norm that would say partisan gerrymandering was impermissible, and therefore they rejected the partisan gerrymandering claim. Um, Justice Kennedy wrote an opinion in which a small portion of it was for the court. Some of it he was writing only for himself. Some parts he was writing for Justice Souter and Justice Ginsburg, and some parts he was writing for Justice Alito and Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, I'm not going to try to make that, that sensible. Um, so they, he ultimately concluded that even if, this is important, mid-decade redistricting is not per se unconstitutional. Nobody seemed to think that that was the case. Nor was um, mid-decade redistricting, even for the exclusive and sole purpose of partisan advantage, unconstitutional. Two members of the court, Justice Stevens and Justice Breyer, said, look, if you're going to do something that is redistricting in the middle of the decade, or any other time for that matter, you at least have, ha have to have a legitimate public purpose. And if you have no legitimate public purpose, then it violates equal protection. And doing it solely for the purpose of partisan advantage is not a legitimate public purpose, therefore denial of equal protection. But they are the only two who have embraced that view. That would have been a simple view, as on the opposite end, so with the non-justiciability, but that's not where we are. Um, I'm running out of time quickly, so I'll just say something quickly about the Voting Rights Act. Um, the court did split five to four, saying that the um, Congressman Bonilla district was a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Justice Kennedy concluding that there was, in fact, dilution of Latino voters by moving them out, and it wasn't made up for by having another district that was a majority Latino community because um, that was split in communities of interest between northern Texas and southern Texas. Um, with respect to the uh, district represented by um, Congressman Frost, they decided, the majority decided that it wasn't a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because there was no dilution because who knows whether even if blacks continually voted for Frost, they would have preferred to vote for a black representative instead. And therefore, there wasn't any, any showing that it really was a dilution of their votes. The other four members of the court uh, disagreed with that. One last thing I want to say. Um, for Justice Scalia, who wants to call the partisan gerrymandering claims non-justiciable and didn't agree with any of the Section 2 violations, he had to go on and consider whether the attack on Congressman Frost's district on the grounds that it was a racial gerrymander uh, and a denial of equal protection, whether that was acceptable or not. And here's an interesting thing. He concluded that, in fact, because they had created a majority-minority district, that it was, in fact, presumptively unconstitutional, but nonetheless, it succeeded because, I'm sorry, it's not Frost, it's the uh, compensating district. It's because, because um, the Texas legislature had to compensate for the one they broke up by creating another majority-minority district that made it purposely um, racial, but it was a compelling purpose because they were trying to avoid another violation of the Voting Rights Act, and they had to do it in order to do that. 
A cynic might say, and I'll end on this, that for Justice Scalia, it's okay to engage in racial gerrymandering if it's to make up for successful partisan gerrymandering. Thank you. we're pausing for a technology break, I would like to take a moment to introduce um, one of the founders of the centers that are co-sponsoring the event tonight. We are lucky to have in the audience um, the founder of the Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation Law and Public Policy, Chuck Williams, who's donated $10 million to fund the Williams Institute at UCLA. Do you want to stand up for a second? Out of the train wreck into the swamp, um, discussing another highly divided opinion is UCLA law professor Ann Carlson, who also directs the Frank G. Wells Environmental Law Clinic. She's going to be talking about Rapinos versus United States with Justice Scalia couldn't even sort out with his Webster's Dictionary. So, <laughs> Professor Carlson. Thanks, Brad. Um, so this is a very important environmental case, but it's also an important case, I think, for shedding light on both of the two new justices, Chief Justice Roberts and Samuel Alito, and also in highlighting the incredibly crucial role that Anthony Kennedy is now playing in the center of the court. Let me start with some background. This is a case brought under the Clean Water Act, more specifically under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, that governs the regulation of wetlands. And um, I'm, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say a word about um, the importance of wetlands, both ecologically but also, very importantly, for things like storm protection, coastal protection, et cetera. So let me start with some photos. If this, yeah, There we go. These are all various types of wetlands. The photo at the bottom is probably the most recognizable form of wetlands and clearly protected under the Clean, Air, Clean Water Act, depending upon exactly where it's located. The other two are probably currently not protected. The one up here with the yellow flowers is called a vernal pool. These are very, very common in the Central Valley of California and extremely important from a biodiversity um, standpoint, but no longer protected under the Clean Water Act. I'll get to um, why not in a moment. And up here, these are agricultural wetlands over here. Also important, also probably not protected under the Clean Water Act currently. Um, and again, I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so wetlands are important for all sorts of reasons. They help um, protect water quality of more traditional bodies of water by in f filtering sediments, uh, toxins, all sorts of things. They help prevent erosion. They um, provide important, uh, they play a very important role in flood control. In fact, there's big worries in Southern California because of the uh, paving over of a lot of wetlands that if we uh, are subject to what we call a 100-year flood, that so many, uh, that, that much of the flood control protection that wetlands provided has is now gone and we're going to see major flooding problems in Southern California. Um, they play a very important role in storm protection, particularly on, along the coast, and they also are extremely important for the habitat both of aquatic and um, aqu aquatic life and birds. Um, I would also, I think, be remiss in um, if I didn't stress the importance of uh, wetland loss in the um, problems that were created in New Orleans as a result of Katrina. Um, scientists estimate that New Orleans has lost about 1,900 square miles of wetlands in the past 75 years. Um, and the building of the levees, which are, of course, in part designed to protect New Orleans from flooding, um, in fact, exacerbates the problem of wetland loss by starving wetlands of nutrients, sediments, et cetera, thus exacerbating the problem. Um, Katrina itself um, caused another 180, or excuse me, 118 square miles of wetlands to be lost. And right now the shipping industry and the oil and gas concerns in the Gulf are quite concerned that the wetlands that were destroyed in Katrina have left them even more vulnerable to uh, hurricanes this season. So there are big efforts right now to try to restore some of those wetlands. California has experienced about a 90% loss of wetlands over the course of the last century. So what's at stake in, um, in this case? Well, wetlands regulations apply to private property owners, and they make private property owners, at least certain private property owners, quite angry. 
Why? Because Section 404 of the Clean Water Act requires a property owner to get a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers if they're going to either dredge or fill a wetland. And the permit requirements are quite um, onerous. Let's see if I can. So um, a property owner needs to meet all three of these conditions in order to dredge or fill, um, meaning that essentially you can't. Oops. He didn't want to dredge or fill. That's our plan. Let me see if I can go back. Is it back? Okay. So those are the permit requirements that a property owner needs to meet. And essentially, the bottom line is that it's very hard to dredge or fill wetlands. If you're going to do so, then you need to make up the property someplace else through all sorts of complex mitigation programs. Um, at stake in the Rapinoe's case itself is which wetlands precisely are covered by the Clean Water Act. How far does the Clean Water Act's jurisdiction extend? And in this case, the question really is whether the Army Corps of Engineers was properly interpreting the Clean Water Act when it subjected John Rapinoe's, whose um, face you'll see in a minute, to um, the, to the um, parameters of the act. It's important to stress here that the Bush administration um, filed an amicus brief in support of extensive jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. In fact, observers, and David, maybe you can say a word about this during the question and answer session, uh, several observers thought that the Solicitor General actually carried the day in the arguments and really persuaded the court not to go as far as the Scalia um, plurality would have um, and really persuaded the court to um, to maintain fairly expansive jurisdiction over a number of um, wetland acres. So the Bush administration was consistent with all the administrations that have administered the Clean Air Act since it was passed in 1970 in arguing for expansive federal jurisdiction over a lot of wetland acreage. Um, the, the real issue here is that wetlands can be quite far from the bodies of water that are actually covered by the Clean Wa Water Act. And so the question is, when they're far away, what, do you, what does the federal government need to do to establish authority to regulate under the Clean Water Act? Okay, so here's... Let's see if I'm going to get through now. There's um, John Rapinos. Um, he and um, actually some other property owners whose cases were consolidated with this case, own, um, own, he owns a number of um, acres of property in Michigan um, and, and wanted to fill wetlands in order, we think, to develop housing. Um, as with many Supreme Court cases, the facts in the case depend upon who's describing them. So I'll tell you what the plurality says first, plurality authored by Scalia first says about the case, and then I'll give you some facts that the dissent fills in. Um, so Scalia tells us that John Rapinos backfilled wetland acreage with no permit and that, that those acres were 11 to 20 miles from the nearest body of navigable water. The wetlands drain into a ditch, and I'm going to show you a not great picture of that ditch. You can see it running along here. This ditch then drains into a river that is a body of water covered under the Clean Water Act, and that river in turn drains into Lake Huron. Okay. He owns several parcels. This is just one of them, but this gives you an illustration of what we're talking about when there's um, a question about whether the Clean Water Act ought to extend to these sorts of wetlands. The dissent um, adds some facts, um, including the fact that um, John Rapinos initially hired a consultant to tell him whether there were wetlands on his property. The consultant came back with a report saying, yes, indeed, there were wetlands and that he indeed needed to get a permit. He then told the consultant he would destroy him if he didn't destroy the report. Um, and refused to pay him and told him he wouldn't compensate him unless he changed the report's conclusions. In addition, he was issued a series of administrative notices. He was subject to a cease and desist order on his property to stop him from filling wetlands and went ahead and defied those orders. Um, so there is actually a criminal case pending against him in addition to the civil case that the Supreme Court took up. And this case has been litigated for about 12 years now. It's gone back and forth, up and down the various um, courts, um, and we're not done yet. Um, despite the fact that the plurality opinion and the dissenting opinion describe the facts in different ways, 
it was a relatively straightforward question that the court was a answering in, the, in this case. Um, the question is, are the wetlands that John Rapinos has on his property covered by the Clean Air Act? To put it a slightly different way, did the Army Corps of Engineers correctly exercise its jurisdiction consistent with the Clean Water Act? And then there's an ancillary um, constitutional law question that was not um, that has not been central to the outcome of the case, although is alluded to in the plurality opinion. And that is, if the Army Corps was exercising its jurisdiction properly, um, has Congress nevertheless overstepped its bounds under the Commerce Clause in regulating wetlands that aren't, um, aren't, aren't, don't sufficiently touch on interstate commerce to be covered under congressional power? So let me just... Uh, put that question up for you. This is a different way of phrasing the same question. Um, I should say that there's some background here. We do know that wetlands that are isolated and not connected to bodies of water that are traditionally covered under the Clean Water Act are, um, are not subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. That's from a case from about five years ago known as Swank. Um, we also know that wetlands that are adjacent to bodies of water that are traditionally navigable are subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Also a uh, Supreme Court case of about 21 years ago called uh, Riverside Bayview Homes. Um, so we have a straight, relatively straightforward question. Unfortunately, we still don't know the answer to the question. We don't actually know whether the wetlands that are, subject, that are the subject of this case are actually covered by the Clean Water Act. We do know that we have four separate opinions. So John may win for explaining the most splintered decision. I think I probably come in second here. Scalia offered the, uh, authored the plurality. Um, I'll tell you who was. Oops. Okay, there, and so he's joined by Alito, which tells you something about Justice Alito. He's also joined by Roberts, but uh, what we know about Roberts in this opinion is more complicated than what we know about Alito because he f f also fi filed a separate concurring opinion. And he's joined by Justice Thomas. Um, in that um, plurality opinion, the case is remanded back to the Sixth Circuit, but it's pretty clear from Scalia's opinion that there should be no jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act for these particular wetlands. Um, as you can see here, one of the conditions that Scalia says needs to be met is that the wetlands must be adjacent to what he calls waters of the United States. Not necessarily navigable waters in the traditional sense, but waters of the United States. And then he, he further defines waters of the United States by saying that there needs to, it needs to be a relatively permanent body of water with water flowing through it relatively continuously. So if it dries up, for example, during the summer, it's not likely to be subject to um, Clean Water Act jurisdiction, or at least wetlands adjacent to that sort of body of water, are not covered by the Clean Water Act. Okay, so that's what Scalia does. Um, so if you're thinking about how you count votes now under the current Supreme Court makeup, if you figure that Alito replaces Rehnquist, then there's no real shift here. Because Rehnquist, it's pretty safe to predict, would have joined this group of um, in the plurality in um, voting for very limited Clean Water Act jurisdiction. But John Roberts is much more confusing. He, again, joins in this plurality opinion saying very narrow jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, but then he files a concurring opinion in which he says, after Swank, remember that's the case saying isolated wetlands are not subject to the Clean Water Act. After Swank, the Army Corps and the EPA should have issued a rule defining their jurisdiction, making clear that they can't cover wetlands that we said were not um, not within the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act under Swank, but they could have defined their jurisdiction quite expansively, and we would have deferred to it, because we defer to reasonable agency interpretations of statutes under the Chevron Doctrine. So he files this concurring opinion, and no one can quite make sense of what it means, given that he also joined in the plurality. So one could ask, is he conservative? Or is he moderate? <laughs> is he happy? Or is he? No. Um, it's not entirely clear here. And I think the, the, the problem with the opinion is it leaves everyone puzzled a bit about exactly which Roberts is, is um, going to come through, at least with respect to environmental cases. And I think it's safe to say that Roberts himself seems to be um, confused about which role he wants to play. Um, 
it's also now one thing that's clear is that Kennedy clearly is in the middle on this opinion. Um, he's truly the swing vote. Um, let me say a word about whoops about what Kennedy did here. Kennedy agreed with the plurality that the case should be remanded. But that's about where the agreement ends. Beyond that, he says, um, the only problem with the Sixth Circuit opinion um, in, in which jurisdiction was upheld is that the Sixth Circuit didn't apply the test that we created in a ser these series of cases, Swank and Riverside Bay Homes. And if we, on remand, they should apply that test. And by the way, everything that the plurality said is ridiculous, awful, stupid, wrong, inconsistent with the statute, inconsistent with congressional at um, intent, and essentially agreed with the dissenters um, who would have granted jurisdiction here. So he, he uh, votes with the plurality here in remanding, but his reasoning is squarely consistent with an expansive view of jurisdiction. Um, so the topic of the panel tonight is wither the court. Um, <laughs> One thing that I think is worth noting is that if any of the dissenters or Kennedy retires or dies and we get another Roberts or Alito, we're going to see a significant contraction of federal authority under the Clean Water Act and potentially under um, other environmental statutes, including the Endangered Species Act, which ra raises important Commerce Clause questions. Um, but I think it's also important asking or making clear um, where we are with respect to the Clean Water Act today. So wither the Clean Water Act. Uh, it's fair to say that expansive jurisdiction is essentially retained here, but it's also fair to say that there's a lot of confusion around the edges for property owners, for the Army Corps of Engineers in exercising jurisdiction, and for lower courts. Lower courts have already been embroiled in controversy over how far jurisdiction ought to extend. They're coming out with inconsistent opinions already. There are already two. Ninth Circuit's got an opinion. There's an opinion coming out of Florida. Um, and so if nothing else, you can say that this opinion ca has caused a lot of uncertainty and will continue to unless the Army Corps or Congress decides to step in and try to clarify. Thank you. Next we're going to have Gary Rowe, who's a professor of American legal history and constitutional law, discuss what um, I definitely found one of the most important victories of the Supreme Court term, and probably you did too if you're like me and you don't open your mail unless it's red and says final warning. Um, <laughs> He's also going to discuss Hamden versus Rumsfeld. Gary Rowe. Good evening. Thank you very much, Brad. In Hamdan versus Rumsfeld decided this term, the Supreme Court held five to three that the president lacks the authority in the absence of specific congressional authorization to try enemy combatants held in Guantanamo Bay by special military commissions that were set up after the attacks on 9-11. Chief Justice Roberts did not participate in the case. He was involved in the lower court decision before he was the chief. Justice Stevens wrote a 73-page opinion. Justice Kennedy wrote a 20-page concurring opinion distilling Justice Stevens's 73 pages. <laughs> and Justice Breyer wrote a one-page concurring opinion distilling Justice Kennedy's 20-page opinion. <laughs> Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito all decept dissented, joining one another and writing separately. My goal in this 10-minute talk, <laughs> thank you, Brad, is, is to distill for you what might be the most earth-shaking Supreme Court opinion of the term, or indeed, perhaps, just perhaps, of the last half century. Such a case you would think would be filled with soaring rhetoric, quotable lines. Uh-uh. It's a snooze. <laughs> It has, as the historian Richard Hofstetter said of Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, quote, all the moral grandeur of a bill of lading. <laughs> Not to denigrate commercial law, of course. And I do think, though, that this is the right analogy. To be sure, the opinion is huge. Above all else, it undermines the claims of an administration that has taken the most expansive view of executive power. But it's highly technical eschewing all the bold moves and grand statements conceivably open to the court. Instead, it aggressively puts the president's most adventurous arguments in their place by yawning through them and leaving implicit that its baseline assumptions are in fact a controversial choice rather than an inevitability. <laughs> 
it's this strategy that I want to talk through. Background, shortly after 9-11, Congress enacted the authorization for the use of military force, granting the President the power to do whatever was necessary and appropriate against our enemies, Al-Qaeda, and foreign terrorists. The President then provided in subsequent months an order paving the way for military tribunals, and the Secretary of Defense later provided regulations constituting these special military tribu tribunals. Um, Hamdan was allegedly the driver of Osama bin Laden, and he was found by the President to be eligible to be tried by military commission. So the question presented to the court is, can he be tried by military commission? Okay, I have for you tonight two words in the tradition of Stephen Colbert. The first word <laughs> is subconstitutional law. And my second word is simply Jackson, as in Robert Jackson. This is what I want to talk about. But wait, before we even got to the court, Congress intervened. It passed the Detainee Treatment Act of 2000. Five. It's up on the board, and I have the relevant words in red. It says that no judge or justice shall have jurisdiction over writs of habeas corpus from Guantanamo Bay. Congress does not want the court hearing this. The Supreme Court, in, an opinion by, in the majority opinion by Justice Stevens, says mm, Congress didn't really mean to take away all jurisdiction, they meant that it only applies to cases not yet filed, not to cases that are pending. Justice Scalia, in dissent, cleans Justice Stevens' clock. Essentially, he says, what part of this statute don't you understand? Justice Stevens replies by saying, that's what Congress had to add if they wanted this to be good enough. <laughs> We mean business, Supreme Court. Stand back, really, with sugar on top. In other words, magic words. Scalia has mocked this idea in the past. You have to use magic words if you want to take away jurisdiction. You see, there is this problem in the Constitution. And that is that Article 3, Section 2 says that the jurisdiction of the federal court shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution and federal laws. But a few, a paragraph later, it says, with such exceptions and under such regulations as Congress shall make, which trumps. This is the chicken-egg problem of constitutional law. It, like the chicken-egg, the great chicken-egg debate, the great Homantash and Laka debate, whatever you want, has never been resolved. And the court was not about to do it here. So instead, what the court did is it said, you know, you really have to make a clear statement. So it, and Congress has not made a statement with the requisite clarity. We are not going to use ordinary principles of interpretation that we're going to pretend to. We're kind of going to tilt a little bit. Um, that's why Justice Stevens is interpreting the statute to avoid um, having to face this constitutional problem. But wait, there's another problem. In fact, the case doesn't actually threaten to raise the great unanswered question, chicken-egg problem that I discussed. Here's why. Another provision says that people who are convicted by military tribunals and get 10 years or more as a sentence can go and take an appeal to the D.C. Circuit, a federal court. And let's face it, Hamdan was going to be convicted, as Bob Dole might have said. You know it, I know it, the American people know it. There's no doubt that he was going to be convicted. So what the court is doing is, in the, in the guise of boring statutory interpretation, sub-constitutional law, if you will, it is allowing an anticipatory challenge in order to aggressively reach out and take an issue. It's driving a camel through the eye of a statutory needle. I think the fear was that if the court didn't do this, it would have to remove the H from our program in Wither. Okay, so, so we reach the merits now. Um, the court rejects the jurisdictional challenge. 
Here are the problems with the special military commissions, according to the majority. First, defense counsel and the defendant are often excluded from the proceedings and from viewing some of the evidence. Testimony does not necessarily have to be sworn. Hearsay is admissible, even if it's obtained by what the majority calls coercion. Um, Two-thirds of the commission is all that's necessary to convict. Appeals may be taken to three members of a review panel appointed by the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld in this case. So what do you do if you're a court and you get a case like this? The first thing that came to my mind is to say, pull out my constitution and say due process. This violates due process. And there is precedent on point, the Hamdi case from a couple of years ago, which applied, for those of you who have read it, the famous Matthews versus Eldridge balancing test to figure out what kind of process is due to someone in Guantanamo. But the court would have none of it. It eschews constitutional law and opts for sub-constitutional law, statutory interpretation, which, to a constitutional lawyer anyway, is boring, is a snoozer. That's why the opinion took 73 pages. What Justice Stevens does implicitly and Justice Kennedy explicitly is it invokes uh, my hero, Justice Robert Jackson, our second word for the day. Justice Jackson was a great lawyer, didn't go to a law school, he read. Um, he was also the best writer, as far as I can tell, ever, ever to serve on the court, and he's the author of the famous Youngstown opinion. In Youngstown, Justice Jackson, in a concurring opinion, rejected President Truman's seizure of the steel mills. Um, I'll just put some wonderful lines from Youngstown on the board just to give you a sense of, one, how beautifully he writes. Look at the, the, the metaphor, the dreams of Joseph um, that he uses. And second, uh, he's what Oliver Wendell Holmes might call a fully adult, what, what, what um, Jerome Frank might call a fully adult jurist. He doesn't genuflect to authority. He realizes that we are kind of in it on our own and have to make do as best we can without invoking authority. How often do you read an opinion that says, oh, I'm going at it alone, folks. I can't find any authority on either side. That's what Jackson is doing here. Okay, so um, the court then invokes Youngstown with its three-category scheme, which essentially asks, what is it that Congress would have wanted? Did Congress authorize the president, in which case it's cool? Did the president act on his own, contrary to what Congress wanted, in which case it's not? Or are we in the middle, in this gray zone of twilight, as Jackson calls it? Well, the court goes through and essentially applies Jackson's formula, which, of course, is not self-executing. It doesn't tell you how to come out. And that's where the majority and the dissent really tangle up. Justice, Steve, Justice Thomas, in dissent, says, Congress hasn't said the president can't have military commissions, and therefore under Youngstown it's fine. Stevens says, Congress hasn't said he could, Justice Thomas, with any specificity at all. Tastes great, less filling. How do we resolve this dispute? And Justice Stevens' answer is yawn statutory interpretation. In just a minute, it goes something like this. The Geneva Convention incorporates the law of war. The law of war does not allow conspiracy charges with which Hamdan had been charged. The Uniform Code of Military Justice, a statute, incorporates the Geneva Convention and hence the law of, of war. It's a house the Jack built kind of argument. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which incorporates all these things, trumps the authorization for the use of military force, which is vaguer, even though it's more recent. Military commissions, therefore, because they're not regularly constituted and aren't like regular courts, martial, or Article III courts, just don't cut it. They violate the Geneva Convention, which is incorporated by reference by the Uniform Code of justice. Notice then the modesty of the opinion. It says Congress could give the president anything he wants, sub-constitutional law. And it says that um, the Geneva Conventions don't apply on their own. They apply here only because Congress grabbed them and brought them in. Again, 
all of that can be changed. So in conclusion, where does this leave us? I want to end with Robert Jackson, who probably put it best. We may say that the power to legislate for emergencies belongs in the hands of Congress, as the court did here, but only Congress itself can prevent power from slipping through its fingers. How important, how significant Hamdam is going to be over the next 10, 20, 30 years really depends on how Congress reacts to it over the next election cycle and the next presidential election and probably the cycle after that. So what's it all about? To make sense of the entire term, we have the author of Turning Right, The Making of the Rehnquist Court, and a regular legal commentary, commentator on NPR's Talk of the Nation. To talk to us tonight is LA Times Supreme Court correspondent David Savage. It's good to be here. I'm uh, really impressed, I should say, first off, that uh, you can have five law professors um, talk about cases and do it in 10 minutes. Could have been the help in the back with the uh, time, but uh, it's quite impressive. I, it reminds me of a story about uh, Justice Scalia. <clears throat> when Scalia came on the court from the very first day, he was the most talkative uh, character. And, uh, you know, the, the justices were very old. They'd sit there like uh, pigeons on a railing, just sort of quietly. And, and Scalia would be yapping away. And um, after that first year, Lewis Powell retired. Wonderful old gentleman, had a very soft-spoken manner. I went to see him down in Richmond, and uh, Powell was the kind of person who couldn't say a bad word about anybody, but I said, Justice Powell, I understood you were not too happy about uh, Justice Scalia and asking so many questions, and he said, uh, well, you know, Mr. Savage, he was a law professor, and they speak for the whole hour. <laughs> that was as close as you get as a sharp line out of... Uh, a sharp assessment out of anybody on Powell's part. Uh, it was mentioned that the um, justices are not all that much better known than the um, seven dwarfs. I, uh, if you ask any of them why they don't have uh, television in the court, they'll say one of the things they always say is they like being anonymous, that they can walk the streets. But every time I've talked to any of them about this, you hear these sort of stories that they say that you get the feeling they don't really like it all that much. I used to go, uh, Rehnquist liked to walk a lot because of his bad back, and he'd walk with clerks, and usually in the spring, I'd go to lunch with him, he'd walk over to Pennsylvania Avenue, and I said, you get many people who recognize you on the street? And he said, yeah, it's amazing the number of people come up and ask me for directions how to get to the Supreme Court building. <laughs> they had no idea who he was, and uh, John Stevens would like to come out on the court in the afternoon in the sun and just stand there. And he always looks to me like a Supreme Court justice. He has the white hair and the bow tie. And he said, you know, almost every time I do that, there's somebody down at the bottom of the steps with a camera saying, would you? <laughs> they want him to get out of their photo of the building. And um, Justice Kennedy had been there a short time, and I asked him about this, and he said, uh, you know, I was out on the walk across the plaza, and a young couple held up a camera and said, uh, a photo. And he stopped, and then he realized they wanted him to take a photo of them. They had no idea who he was. And uh, Steve Breyer, uh, who I think Russell worked for, um, says he's recognized a lot, except everybody thinks he's just a suitor. <laughs> and that starts to uh, get on his nerve. The one that I have not seen around the country, and the, I hope some of you spot him someday, Justice Thomas has bought himself what he calls the Big Blue Bus. He bought this giant Winnebago, and he and his wife traveled the country stopping at campgrounds. And he, he has this sort of ordinary guy persona, but I would just love to, you know, see uh, Clarence Thomas and his wife coming along in the big blue bus. It, it's the kind of thing that I think very few people would recognize who they are, particularly in, in campgrounds or whatever. Um, I know you don't want uh, 15 minutes worth of jokes about the court. Uh, <laughs> I'll say a little bit about what we talked about at lunch today. I think we're in the, the second generation of the Reagan uh, court. Uh, John Roberts and Sam Alito came into the government in the early 1980s as really Reagan disciples. They were young conservatives. The Reagan administration really attracted a lot of young conservatives. I think in the la and since World War II, the 
two most important figures uh, in the Supreme Court's history have been former Republican governors of California, Earl Warren and Ronald Reagan. Earl Warren, because he sort of set the court on the course of being the court that was a sort of an aspirational court, that uh, sort of in the sense of the more perfect union and doing justice. And Ronald Reagan, who thought all that was wrong, that judges had overstepped their power, the Supreme Court had no business deciding cases like getting rid of school prayer and striking down the death penalty and the Roe versus Wade, that he wanted a, a, you know, the court to be much more restrained. And that um, there was a series of views that the Reagan administration people had. They didn't agree with the separation of church and state principle. They believed in you know, more accommodation for religion. They're not enthused about environmental protection. They cared about property rights. Uh, they cared very much more about executive power than congressional uh, power. They thought Roe versus Wade was wrong, of course, and that the court had gone too far in striking down the abortion laws. Um, in almost all those areas, um, Sam Alito and John Roberts have the Reagan view. But I thought last year when you listened to Roberts, if you listened to him during the hearings, you remember he began with that, um, I thought, a really masterful opening statement. Short, simple words. He talked about uh, judges like an umpire. You know, we, we call the balls and strikes. We don't make the rules. You don't go to the game to see the umpire. He's not the star of the show. It's a very simple way, I think, of saying I want a more modest court, a court that's not going to turn things around and make, make law. And I thought in this first term, there were a number of decisions that where Roberts really acted like a modest judge, somebody who wanted the court not to be at the forefront of striking down laws. And I think almost every case from this end coming this way fit that mold. They weren't going to strike down the Solomon Amendment but a bunch of law professors saying it violated their First Amendment rights to have the military recruiters on campus. That was a, a loser, and uh, in fact, it was, as Russell said, a unanimous decision. The law professors were free to say, I disagree with the military. You shouldn't, you students, you shouldn't go to work for the Pentagon. They discriminate against gays. Law professors weren't forced to say anything. They weren't prohibited from saying anything. So we're going to uphold the Solomon Amendment. That was not a close call. Same thing on the uh, Ceballos. Uh, there was five, five of them were not going to say, if you're a lawyer working for L.A. City or whatever, and you have some disagreement with your boss, and you say we ought to do this, and the supervising attorney says, no, we're not going to do that. You don't have a First Amendment right to sue him if the boss sort of disagrees with you and, and sort of Put, shunt you aside. They weren't going to allow federal courts and the First Amendment, and Steve Reinhardt, to be deciding all these cases involving uh, government employees. They were going to sort of stand back. Um, there are two cases where I think that goes the other way, and Anne has talked about one, um, which is the wetlands case. For 30 years, the federal government had taken the position that because water flows downhill, the only way to prevent pollution of the Santa Monica Bay or, or Lake Huron was to prohibit, go upstream and prohibit pollution of the wetlands and streams way upstream. John Roberts and Scalia, Alito and Thomas would have overturned that rule and said, no, the federal government's power only applies to things like the Mississippi River and other continuous flowing bodies of water. That would have eliminated all the wetlands in the West because the streams are dry part of the year. Now, there's a good legal argument to say if you read the Clean Water Act, that's what it could be read to mean. But it strikes me as a not a modest step to overturn 30 years of law in your first... They took that case the first week Roberts was there as Chief Justice. It was the first week in October, uh, first week in October, they met for their first regular conference and they granted that case. That was the conservatives reaching out to say, you know, the old property rights, not environmental protection. Now it fell one vote short because of uh, Tony Kennedy. The other one was... David, can you just say a word about Roberts' concurring opinion then? What and how you think that squares with the... I think it's a little bit bizarre, Ann. Uh, I, I, ask, uh, I had lunch with uh, 
Paul Clement, who's the Bush administration solicitor general. And this is probably one of these off the record lunches, so don't print this anywhere. Uh, I said, what do you think of Robert's concurrence? And he said, well, where did that come from? He only had four votes. You know, why is he telling the government what to do? He was in the dissent. But the point, though, Ian, is that Roberts was going to take it either way. He was either going to get five votes and restrict the federal environmental protect authority on his own, or the Bush administration should do it for us. But the, the, I guess my problem with that is if there, there are a lot of good things to say about John Roberts. He's a very smart guy, as, as smart a guy from the bench as I have ever seen. Uh, and the, right away, he sort of took command of the arguments. He, he will be around a long time and had a lot of influence. But I do think that's the kind of case where Congress, the Republican Congress could have rewritten the Clean Water Act. The Reagan administration could have rewritten the Clean Water Act. The Bush administration, why the Supreme Court? If your guys is, we should be modest. And the other one is the Oregon's Death with Dignity Act. That's what some people call the Assisted Suicide Act, and I made the point at lunch, is that the people from Oregon don't like the word suicide because suicide connotes you choose to die. These people were dying. They are dying. They're terminally ill. It's not their choice to die. The law basically said, this was approved twice by the people of Oregon, that says if you are terminally ill and two doctors certify you have less than three months to live, a doctor can prescribe for you a dose of lethal medication so you can end your life on your own. Um, I think a lot of people do it either because they're fearful of pain or they don't want to be totally helpless for their last weeks. In 1997, the Supreme Court said there's no constitutional right to die. We're not going to go down the road of Roe versus Wade and decide this on our own. We're going to leave it to the states and their elected representatives. That's exactly what happened in Oregon. But at that time, some conservatives in Congress, Henry Hyde and one John Ashcroft from Missouri, asked Janet Reno to intervene and to uh, essentially void the Oregon law by saying it violated the federal drug control laws. And Reno put out a, 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 an opinion and said, no, it doesn't. The drug control laws gave the federal government the power to restrict dangerous drugs, narcotics. It didn't give me as the attorney general the right to decide what's proper medical practice. That's left to the states. The states license doctors. They have a traditional power to regulate medicine. I'm not going to intervene. Ashcroft then tried to get a bill through Congress, Republican uh, Congress. It failed. He then was appointed Attorney General by George Bush, and in November of 2001, two months after September 11th, when people's minds were on other things, he put out an executive order that said any doctor who prescribes lethal medication is violating the federal drug control laws, I have decided, because that's not acting with a legitimate medical purpose. Oregon's doctors, the state attorneys, went to federal court to void the block Ashcroft's order. They won in the federal district court. They won in the Ninth Circuit. The case came up to the Supreme Court. It was heard last fall. And in January, a 6-3 to three decision affirmed the Ninth Circuit. Kennedy, O'Connor, and the four liberals basically agreed with the view that Janet Reno had said, is that the federal drug control law was about narcotics. It wasn't about giving the Attorney General the power to decide what standard medicine. John Roberts joined Scalia and Thomas in dissent. They would have said that we're going to uphold the power of one federal official to void the wishes of the states and their voters and to rewrite a long-standing law <coughs> not based on what Congress said but what John Ashcroft said. Now, that didn't strike me as a modest act either. Um, so I think it's very um, unclear. We know uh, Roberts and Sam Alito are going to be around a long time. I used to, I said at lunch today, you know, every speech or every paper needs some statistics. And mine are uh, 86, 73, 58, 56, and 51. The two oldest 
members of the court, the two most liberal members of the court, John Stevens is 86, Ruth Ginsburg is 73. The three of the most conservative members of the court, Clarence Thomas is 58, Sam Alito is 56, and um, Roberts is 51. So the, the second generation of the Reagan court is going to be around a long time. Uh, you guys are all going to be veteran lawyers uh, when the John Roberts is still at the midpoint of being Chief Justice. And I think it's very, it would be very interesting to see whether we really get a sort of modest court that sort of steps back from deciding big issues and sort of leaves more matters in the hands of Congress and the states, or, or whether we're going to get a more aggressively conservative court that sort of intervenes for the things that conservatives uh, really care about. I'd like to say one thing. Um, I think the one thing for the for the next term, which I think will be a a big term in some other respects, is the a case about the use of race and assignment in public schools. Um, because Justice Kennedy is so much at the center of the court, it's highly likely, I think, that five members of the court, a majority of the court, um, are going to at least take seriously, and I would guess. Uh, embrace the notion that the use of of um, racial classifications for students to keep schools integrated um, is going to be severely limited. And that will be a huge change. Um, property rights also, I think, will, you know, the, the wetlands regulation may be one thing, I think, when it comes to takings cases, those are likely to change somewhat. And the religion cases that David Savage talked about a little bit ago about the accommodation. Um, I would expect that those might very well uh, end up being significant changes. So th those are the things that I look for. Um, I would add a very important environmental case that the court has granted cert on. It's a D.C. Circuit case. The question is whether the EPA uh, has the authority to or indeed is required to regulate carbon dioxide emissions, which are the principal, green is the principal greenhouse gas. Um, it has huge implications also for whether California, which has passed regulations um, regulating greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, that case will, will heavily determine whether California is authorized to do so. So I think on the environmental front, it's going to be a huge case, and it's very interesting that the court granted cert on it. Yeah, I echo John's comment about uh, the race case. This is, I think, one of the most interesting long-running disputes in the law, and all of you would know it which is there's really two fundamentally different views among liberals and conservatives about race. It's, it, you know, it goes way back. And the, the sort of liberal civil rights view is that racial discrimination against minorities is a, um, a, a, an awful thing, and we ought to entirely prevent it, stop it. Um, however, because of the racial history of this country, it's not wrong to sometimes use, consider race in, for example, affirmative action in college admissions. There's a, I think the liberal view is that there's a difference between racial discrimination against minorities and something like uh, affirmative action. Uh, what Brennan and Marshall used to call benign race conscious programs, which I always thought was sort of a jarring phrase, but nonetheless that there was a that there was good uses of race and bad uses. The conservative view, and John Roberts feels it very strongly, he, he wrote in that voting rights case he, a line that says something like, it's a sordid business this divvying us up by race. In other words, he was deeply offended that Texas was forced to require forced to try to create a Latino majority district. Roberts and the conservatives think that's entirely wrong, that racial using race of for any reason is wrong, and they jumped at this school case because this school case in Seattle there's only like three three hundred kids were affected by this. They have a, some sort of plan that tries to maintain some sort of racial integration guidelines in the high schools and sometimes
if the high school is already 80 percent white and I want to send my son there, they might say, no, your son doesn't get his first choice high school, he has to go somewhere else. I think five of them are likely to say that is racial discrimination and it's unconstitutional and no such voluntary school integration programs can stand if they use race as a classification. And that's, that's a big deal. Before we open more questions, Gary, I just have to, I have to hear with Jones versus Flowers. Do you want to say a few words? Um, well, in, the theme here is Jackson. <laughs> Jackson, again. And the point I, wanted to, I would want to make with that case is that um, the Roberts Court here has once again followed the teachings of Justice Jackson, who in a in a case called the Mullane versus Central Hanover Bank, my favorite case in the whole wide world, in 1950, um, wrote, defined due process in a new and creative way depending on the practicalities and exigencies of the circumstances. So in, in the Jones case, the court was faced with a problem of someone whose land was sold, whose house was sold for failure to pay his property taxes because he had moved out and the notice of a delinquency was returned to the state tax service in Arkansas. And what did they do? They threw it away. And the court decided that due process requires that the state do a little bit more. Um, that they actually try to inform the person that they owe taxes. And that if the letter comes back, a reasonable person would not find the notice acceptable. And in so doing, the court um, gave concrete definition to the framework that Justice Jackson set out in his opinion in Bullain. So the point I want to make with that case is, once again, the Roberts Court is emerging, perhaps, as the Jackson Court, the Jackson second generation court. And it's not totally ironic, because John Roberts, at his confirmation hearings, said he was a big fan of Robert Jackson. This was, the, I thought, the best small case to say something good about John Roberts because this was a sort of little people's justice case, the kind where Clarence Thomas is always on the side of the government. Because this fella, <laughs> really, um, this fella had bought and paid for this house. He got divorced and he moved away, but his daughter was still living in the house. Um, and when the mortgage was paid off, um, you know, he had been paying the property taxes through the mortgage. Well, she never paid the property taxes, so the house was going to be lost for unpaid property tax. All they did was send out a notice, certified notice, that was then came back as undelivered. And the state of Arkansas said, okay, fine, we can now take the house. And John Roberts, you know, was the only one of the, you know, there was the four liberals and, and Roberts, was they said, come on, the government could do something more than that. Couldn't you at least go out and put up a notice on the house and say, this house hasn't is delinquent if the taxes are not paid? The, the fellow who lost, he, he only learned about it when somebody else had bought the house. So Mr. Jones was suing to get back his house. And, you know, Clarence Thomas said, oh, we can't extend due process this far. You can't expect the government to do all this kind of thing. <laughs> I thought it was a good sign that John Roberts said, come on, wake up. They could do a little more than that. Next question. Yeah. In an event last fall, Professor Chemerinsky was asked what he thought a Chief Justice Roberts would be like. He said, essentially, that he thought Roberts would be too intellectually pure to let the sort of partisan priorities guide the way he writes opinions, alleging that the previous Chief Justice had done just that. I'm wondering what you think about that comment now that you've had a year to reflect on uh, the Chief Justice's opinion. I'm shocked Irwin would say that. I didn't think that was his real view. Uh, it's always a hard thing to, uh, you know, a, a lot of people have sort of basic strong views of the law what's right, you know, what's the First Amendment Establishment Clause mean, or what's the, what's the right result on race? You know, is, uh, is affirmative action unconstitutional, or is affirmative action a good thing, or at minimum, something that a college should be able to do? 
I find it, I, I do think John Roberts is going to be on the conservative side of the big divide, but I think that's because he thinks that's what the law and the Constitution require. I don't think it's because he said, well, what would George Bush want me to do or something, or what's the Republican Party want me to do? That's just his view of, of the, so I, I wouldn't want to characterize it as either pure or partisan, because I think it's so much in the eye of the beholder. I would also say it depends on the time frame we're looking at. I mean, the president put John Roberts on the court. One thing on the president's mind, and I would suspect central to it, was Roberts' views on executive power. Um, I don't think there's a lot of doubt about where he stands. He was refused in Hamdan because he joined the majority on the D.C. Circuit, uh, rejecting Hamdan's claims. Um, the interesting thing will be you know, in the next generation, in the next cycle, when executive power isn't the issue, when something that we don't think about is the issue. That's the time when justice can really come into his or her own voice because the kinds of partisan things that led to his appointment, the um, things the president had in mind, are no longer there. As a uh, part-time cynic, I also will be interested to see whether the uh, Roberts and Alito are big believers in executive power when someday there's a Democrat in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yeah. Uh, Professor Carlson, in the Rapanos case, really his concurrence, is that largely based on statutory interpretation of like Swank was, or is uh, that group trying to say that the limitations by federal power would prohibit Congress from going that far up? Would you mind repeating the question before? Yeah, the question is whether the Scalia plurality in the Rapanos case is based um, largely on statutory interpretation or also involves constitutional questions of congressional power. And the, the answer is that it's largely a statutory opinion. Um, that's principally because um, the court or the plurality could frame the question as, is the Army Corps exceeding the jurisdiction granted to it by the Clean Water Act and through a series of arguments, including relying on a 1954 Webster's Dictionary definition of flowing water, says, yes, it's exceeding jurisdiction, and we don't need to reach the constitutional question. Um, so it, it's a lot like Swank in that respect. They allude to the constitutional issues and say, and of course, when we're looking at an agency acting, we're reminded or we're um, cognizant of the fact that they're stretching the outer bounds of congressional jurisdiction uh, under the Constitution, but we don't actually need to reach that question. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, if I may ask a uh, 30-second question, Professor Rowe. Uh, I asked the LAPD captain, what's the story on uh, uh, police brutality on the media? And I started to stand by and say that we didn't hear our side of the story. So I said, okay, there is a two sides of the story. And the captain answered, there's a third side. What's the third side? He said, true. Now, saying that, uh, Osama bin Laden and uh, his crony, I don't know how many of them planned and did a 9-11 power, you know, that was uh, aggression. Now, U.S. invaded uh, Af Afghanistan and occupied. The so ordinary soldiers, whatever, civilians, they have nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, now, U.S. arrest them, brought to uh, Guantanamo Bay, and then named as an enemy combatant, you know. So they have nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, they, in a way, their side of stories are they fought for their own country against the invading forces, you know, for their side of the story. Now, did the Supreme Court say anything, whether this uh, term of uh, enemy combatant is illegal? The Supreme Court did not. The Supreme Court restricted its opinion and relied at the beginning on a concession or on a point made by Hamdan's lawyers that they were not challenging and not raising the issue of the detention of enemy combatants. They were restricting their gaze to cases involving the constitutionality of the special military tribunals set up by the President and the Secretary of Defense. So that issue is out there, it's looming, and it's wide open. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yeah. Has there been any discussion anywhere, and I'm ignorant of the decisions, but that Ceballos was not just a typical employee 
but was a prosecutor with a who's in whose supervisors as well have not only a duty to seek conviction but also to seek justice. Yeah, I mean that that's the big concern. If you could repeat the question. Um, yeah. So the, cons the the question is whether there's been any sort of discussion or attention paid to the fact that Sabias was not just any public public employee; he was a district attorney, and part of his job was sort of pursuing justice. I mean, he sort of had a higher obligation than just um, obeying his supervisors, and that's part of what makes this case so difficult. There had been a stream of cases before, earlier, in which. Um, employees disagreed with their supervisors about what was supposed to go in a memo or a report, and they were pretty easy cases. Most of them were decided, though, on the grounds of was a speech on a matter of public concern. So the court didn't have to do what it did in this case, in, in earlier cases, because the way that these cases were previously decided was on the question of whether speech, whether the speech was on a matter of public concern. This case was hard because Tobias's speech clearly was on a matter of public concern. So the court couldn't bump it and say it's not protected because it's this internal speech. It was internal speech, but it was clearly on a matter of public concern. So the court was really faced with a difficulty here precisely because of the nature of Tobias's job. Um, and this is what's so difficult. The court was facing two different sort of lines of precedent here, two different lines of, 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 of cases. One wanted to say, and it traditionally said, matters of internal dispute are excluded from First Amendment protection. We don't want to get involved. And then we have this other precedent, the long line, that says if it's a matter of public concern, it's got to get protection. The majority here went one way. They leaned in favor of saying we don't want to get involved if it's an internal dispute. The dissent wanted to sort of split the baby a little bit more and say, we want to still focus on the kind of speech if it's an internal um, a part of the official duties and a matter of sort of internal office politics in a sense, we're going to raise the bar, but we don't want to lose that speech altogether. So this is precisely why the Sabias case was so difficult, because of the nature of his job and because of the, Im the importance of his speech. Uh, do you think that a conservative court will slow social change, or do you think that it will affect social change just as much as a liberal court, but in a different way? <laughs> well, that's, that's obviously a hard question. I you want to start by repeating the question, and then... Well, he asked whether the, a conservative court would slow social change, or... Or what? Or affect uh, social change as much as a liberal court, but just in a different way. Uh, my sense of the what the conservatives want out of the conservative court is a stand back, do nothing court. And I think on the gay rights issue, for example, you can say somewhere down the road, uh, the Supreme Court is going to say sometime in our lifetime, I know in your lifetime, maybe mine, that uh, this is a sort of same-sex marriage, that there's a constitutional right to, to marry. But they're probably not going to do it until only Mississippi and Alabama don't recognize some sort of right, you know? In other words, they're not going to get out ahead of a social movement, but they're not going to block it either. I, I don't see any move to block social change. It's just that I, I don't think there's any instinct among the justices now to get very far out ahead of any... Uh, Unless they overturn Roe v. Wade. I mean, if, if, if ever you want to you know, change social fabric, it's by overturning Roe v. Wade. It would alter dramatically the way women live in this country, in large swaths of the country where you're not going to see legislative protection. Don't it, it, see how, I mean, and then certainly there are conservatives who are, whose number one agenda item is to overturn and don't you think, Ann, the likelihood is that that depends on the next election? That if there's another conservative Republican who gets elected on a pro-life platform and promises to put justices on the Supreme Court who are pro-life, I assume five years, eight years from now, they will overturn Roe versus Wade, but do it in a series of, you know, steps. There'll be a series. Rehnquist's ideal, I think, was to write an opinion that says, oh, by the way, we over, of course, we overturned Roe essentially <laughs> four years ago, and that opinion we wrote where we didn't, you know, sort of do it quietly and casually. But, but I think that's a situation where the conservatives will think that's what the country voted for. They keep electing conservative Republicans. They elect a Republican Senate 
the conservatives say we're pro-life, we're opposed to Roe, and the public keeps electing them, we're following the... I have a broader view about all this, which is that regardless of the issue, it, first of all, it depends on what you mean by conservative. If what you mean by conservative is judicially restrained across the board, then I don't think they will do much. But I don't think that's the court we have. I think when, what you're talking about is conservative with respect to a variety of values, and therefore I think the social impact is likely to be just as great. So, for example, if there's a greater accommodation of religion in the public square by this court, then it will let loose all kinds of forces between religious and uh, separationist factions in the country that will have a significant impact. If they decide that race can't be used in any, in any fashion with respect to uh, affirmative action, that will have significant effects. If they decide that prop private property rights are terribly important and therefore business and environmental regulation need to be severely restricted, that will let loose, you know, you want to call class warfare, whatever it is. But it seems to me that all of those can't be, and there are, there are tons of others, those, those kinds of decisions can't be made without having significant social impact. So I think what really ultimately happens, ironically, is that when the court decides one thing, it invigorates um, the backlash by opponents, and they actually become more politically active. So I, it seems highly doubtful to me that whatever their particular agenda, that they're not going to have a significant social impact. Great. Um, our time is up, so I want to thank everyone on the panel for a great discussion.